Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Impulse Control Disorders, Behavioral Addictions, Insights from Dopaminergic Medication-Related Behaviors in Parkinson's Disease, presented by Dr. Valerie Boon. I'm Julianne Charitz of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking site and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. We apologize that we are not doing a Q&A for this presentation. Please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus provides free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located on the bottom left hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Valerie Voon. Dr. Valerie Voon is a neuropsychiatrist and principal investigator in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge. She completed her medical degree at the University of British Columbia and psychiatry residency at the University of Toronto. Her PhD in neuroscience jointly through the University College London and National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke focus on mechanisms underlying dopaminergic medication-induced impulse control disorders in Parkinson's disease. She has been a Wellcome Trust Fellow in Clinical Neurosciences for the last five years at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Boone's research group focuses on mechanisms underlying impulsivity, compulsivity, and relevance to disorders of addiction across both drug and natural rewards. She uses a multimodal approach, including atomical and functional MRI, PET, pharmacological challenges, computational modeling, and cognitive neuroscience. She has published extensively with over 100 peer-reviewed publications, including in high-impact journals such as Neuron, Molecular Psychiatry, Lancet, Neurology, Annals of Neurology, Brain and Biology Psychiatry, and she's a fellow of the American Neuropsychiatric Association. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Boone. Well, thanks so much um, to the uh, organizers for the invitation to speak. It is very much a pleasure to be here and to be able to talk about this um, particular topic. So I'm going to be um, talking about impulse control disorders, or also known as behavioral addictions, related to the dopaminergic medications in Parkinson's disease. You'll see there's a range of different behaviors that are related. So we see things like pathological gambling, compulsive sexual behaviors, um, you see um, binge eating behaviors and also compulsive shopping. Now, I realize that this is a bit of a sensationalist slide. It does come from the Daily Mail. Um, and this is actually someone who was involved in a class action lawsuit related to a dopamine agonist. And you can see the title says Parkinson's medication turning me into a gambling gay sex thief. Um, but in fact, there are very real consequences um, to these behaviors related to the dopaminergic medications. And in this particular case, this person um, was gambling, lost up to 130,000 euros related to the dopaminergic medications, started exposing himself, cross-dressing, and was getting into trouble sexually. Indeed, in um, previous um, class action lawsuits, at least in one case, um, there was $8.2 million US that was awarded in, in a case in Minneapolis. Um, there are um, now with the FDA, there are warnings with regards to these behaviors being related to, to some of the dopamine agonists. So just so everybody's on the same um, page, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna explain a little bit about the background of Parkinson's disease and just give you um, just sort of a bit of context. So Parkinson's disease um, is classically a disorder of um, movement symptoms. So you get this tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, um, but now we understand it as actually much more broad than that. It's a neuropsychiatric disorder with clear-cut cognitive components, neuropsychiatric aspects. 
Again, with regards to the underlying um, neurodegeneration, you get uh, classically, again, neurodegeneration affecting the um, substantia nigra, pars compacta, um, with neurodegeneration of the dopaminergic cell bodies, which project to the motor regions. And much more variably and much more intact is the ventral tegmental area, which project more to limbic regions. What we also understand now about Parkinson's is that it has gone, um, we understand it beyond just a dopaminergic etiology, um, it, this clear cut neurodegeneration affecting serotonergic systems, noradrenergic systems, and also acetylcholine. But in this particular case, and for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus in particularly on the dopaminergic system. Let me just describe a little bit about the dopaminergic medications also. We're going to talk a little more about levodopa and also about the dopamine agonists, but just again, so everyone's on the same page. Um, levodopa is a precursor of dopamine, so it is processed into dopamine or broken down into dopamine, so it can act both intracellularly and also extracellularly. And um, in contrast, dopamine agonists act on the presynaptic or the postsynaptic dopamine receptors. So you can see in this case, either on um, the, the presynaptic D2 autoreceptor or any of the postsynaptic dopaminergic receptors. And there's a range of dopamine agonists that are available. The ones that you're going to hear about will um, include pranopexol, ropinirole. You can see here that this greater perhaps D2, D3 affinity for pranopexol and ropinirole as compared to some of the other ones which have perhaps a little bit more D1 um, as relative to D2, D3. Now, how frequent are these behaviors um, in the context of Parkinson's disease? So this is a, the Dominion study, which is a multi-center study involving over 3,000 patients uh, that took place in North America. So it's a very large sample size. And what we see here is that the, do, the behaviors occurred in 13.6 patients. So that's actually 14%. Um, in subjects who were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and um, were on dopaminergic medications. You can see it's broken up into a range of different um, frequencies with problem gambling, hypersexuality, compulsive shopping, and binge eating disorder reasonably um, equally um, in terms of distribution. Now, it's actually not that much different from what you'd expect to see in the general population. So you can see the general population figures in the next column over. But I think the key thing is actually when it actually occurs. So in the context of um, problem gambling, for instance, um, gambling after the age of 55 is actually not that common. So you can see here it occurs in a general population at about 13.4%. And in contrast, um, these behaviors are new onset in these, in these Parkinson's patients, um, and they occur in the context of having been exposed to dopaminergic, um, to, to dopaminergic agents, and not necessarily prior to this. So there is something unusual about the onset um, occurring at a much later age associated with the dopaminergic medications. In terms of the phenomenology or how they present, there's certain behaviors that link them. So things like um, the people being very preoccupied with the behaviors, being unable to control the urges, that they're persistent, and that there's significant consequences. Um, so in a study that we conducted in Canada, um, the mean amount that was lost was actually 100,000 US, uh, sorry, Canadian dollars. So it certainly can have significant financial consequences. And certainly the um, kind of marital and social consequence, consequences can also be marked. Now, again, this is from the Dominion study in terms of it lo it's looking at the association with um, dopaminergic medications. So here we see um, that the impulse control behaviors have a very clear cut association with dopamine agonists. And the odds ratio there is 2.72. You can see that it occurs across all the different behaviors, so all the different ICDs. It's not specific to any of them. And there's also a very clear cut association an independent association with just the presence of levodopa alone. So the presence of levodopa alone is an independent predictor. 
and the dose of levodopa is also an independent predictor. So there's something beyond just dopamine agonists, there is indeed a, a, a clear association also with levodopa. There's also been um, identified a range of different um, associated factors. So again, this is from the Dominion study. And what we see here is associated factors actually look remarkably similar to what you'd expect associated with um, pathological gambling in the general population. So things like a family history of gambling, smoking behaviors, um, alcohol use disorders is a little bit mixed mainly because it tends to co-occur with all the other behaviors. So it's not necessarily an independent um, uh, associated factor. Certainly we see um, significant levels of depression, high novelty seeking and high impulsivity. And all of these are very much related to um, what you'd see in terms of associated factors um, in pathological gambling in the general population. So very much suggesting that there might be similar overlapping neural substrates um, or that this is a role for individual susceptibility. And one of the remarkable things about this is in part that there's actually a range of people who are on these medications at you know, similar doses. And what is it that makes one person develop this behavior, but not another person? So what is it about that 14% that develop these behaviors? And then the other component is why does someone develop one behavior, not another behavior? So why buying behaviors or binge eating or hypersexual, I mean, not another one? And we are starting to understand a little bit surrounding this. So these are the gender proportions. And again, this is from the Dominion um, study. And what we see here is that men in red are more likely to express compulsive sexual behaviors as compared to the women in black um, who are much more likely to express buying behaviors and binge eating behaviors. And indeed, this is actually similar to what you'd expect to see in the general population in terms of the proportions, um, in terms of the gender proportions. Again, you also see uh, differences in terms of novelty seeking and novelty seeking is a trait um, that's also associated with substance use disorders. And the way we can, one of the ways in which we can assess it, very classic way, is through questionnaires. And the types of questions we ask people would be things like, uh, do you often try new things for fun or thrills? Um, and do you like to do things with, um, uh, without regard for strict rules and regulations? In fact, what we end up seeing is that pathological gamblers and compulsive shoppers, again, this is from the Dominion study, what we see is that those two groups are elevated in terms of novelty seeking compared to Parkinson's controls without impulse control behaviors. And in contrast, you don't see that with hypersexuality or binge eating. So suggesting that there are certain subgroup differences um, that might play itself out in terms of why someone might develop a specific behavior, not another. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this um, at a later stage. Okay, so just to um, kind of put things into context a little bit, we're going to be, the, the way I sort of conceptualize these behaviors is a relationship between um, what is the underlying Parkinson's disease? Is there a role for Parkinson's disease, the underlying neurobiology? Um, indeed, more of the more recent studies would suggest that there may indeed be a role for Parkinson's disease, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Is there a role for individual susceptibility? I think we've already discussed that potentially there may be um, underlying individual susceptibilities in terms of why a certain proportion may develop these behaviors, but not necessarily um, the, the, all the people who are um, exposed to dopamine agonists. And certainly there is this interaction between the dopaminergic medications and either the two other factors. So we're going to start by asking what is the role of Parkinson's disease? And again, as I've mentioned before, there is this kind of imbalance between dorsal striatal and ventral striatal regions or um, substantial nigra versus ventral tegmental area regions. And it, this, you'll see this predominantly in terms of rodent studies, and we'll, we'll talk about the reinforcing properties of dopaminergic medications. We'll talk a little bit about how dopamine function is affected, and then what specific cognitive processes may be affected. So here we're going to talk a little bit about 
um, the role of reward, um, cues, learning from feedback, and a few different subtypes of impulsivity. Um, I don't have the time um, to talk about the role of subthalamic deep brain stimulation, um, but certainly that's something that um, I would be happy to, to answer at a later stage. So let's start by asking, is there a role for Parkinson's disease? And indeed, this is new data within the last several years, mostly from rodent studies. And there's kind of two, two sets of people who've been studying it, it includes Celeste Napier's group and Pierre Olivier um, Fernagut. And what they've been showing is um, potentially an influence um, of the Parkinsonian rodent model, particularly on reinforcing, um, reinforcing um, behaviors or reinforcement sorry, reinforcing behaviors related to the dopaminergic uh, medications. So in this particular study, um, what we're seeing here is 6-hydroxydopamine infused into the dorsolateral striatum, and that results in neurodegeneration specific to the substantia nigra pars compacta, so about 50% neurodegeneration, whereas the VTA itself remains intact. What they then did was they looked at um, the condition place preference for um, pranopexal. So does a rodent prefer the chamber that's been conditioned to pranopexal or conditioned to saline? And what you see here is that the lesions, that the, the rodents who've had the lesion in the dorsolateral striatum have this preference, this condition place preference towards the pranopexal condition chamber. And you see that um, it's not significant in the sham lesion. Whereas if you increase the dose of pranopexal sufficiently, you do actually see that um, the rodents do have overall a preference for um, a condition place preference um, for the pranopexal condition chamber. This is a slightly different study. Um, and this, in this particular one, the 6-hydroxydopamine was then infused into the substandard nigra pars compacta. And what we see here then is lesions affecting 51% of the tyroxine hydroxylase positive cells, so the dopaminergic cells, in the substantia nigra pars compacta, but it also affects the ventral tegmental area at 32%. So suggesting that there isn't the same kind of imbalance between the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area. But in this particular study, then, what you see is a measure of progressive ratio. So looking at the final ratio, so how hard is the rodent willing to work for this in terms of lever presses? And overall, you see that there is an increase in the final ratio. So the breakpoint is about five for pranopexal. And indeed, it's actually quite a bit higher for things like cocaine. It is a, it's about 100. Um, but it is indeed elevated but there's no clear-cut effect of the lesion. So pranopexal is a reinforcing, certainly not, not by any means close, that anywhere close to cocaine, but it's also no effect of the Parkinsonian lesion itself. What the authors do see, though, is that um, there's greater delta Fos B accumulation um, in the neurons, particularly within the medial striatum, in the, in the lesioned um, rodents. And if you look specifically at lesion rodents and you look at the relationship between this progressive ratio, the final ratio, and the um, delta Fos B accumulation, you see that it's actually a positive correlation between the accumulation in the nucleus accumbens core and this willingness to work for pranopexone. So this is kind of um, relationship between this molecular marker um, and um, this willingness to work um, for the drug. And delta Fos B is well known to be associated with substances or drugs of abuse. What about in terms of um, levodopa? There is actually a relationship also with levodopa. And again, using a Parkinsonian rodent model, a slightly different version this time, where they have a vector that overexpresses um, alpha-synuclein, human alpha-synuclein, and they infuse this, or they inject this within the substantia nigra pars compacta. You can see that there is specific neurodegeneration um, of the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra without affecting the ventral tegmental area. 
And here the authors have looked at the CPP score, the condition place preference score, and can see that the rodent prefers the chamber that's been associated with levodopa rather than shaman or vehicle. I think this didn't show up very well, but um, what they also show is, um, actually this didn't show up very well at all, but what they also show is that um, the rodent um, uh, that's been lesioned also has um, a decreased preference or decreased intake of um, sweetened water, so this non-drug reward. So this is the idea that um, the rodents actually has a preference and this higher reinforcement value of the drug itself, which in this case is levodopa, um, but less less um, incentive or salience um, uh, to take a non-drug reward, so in this case sweetened water. So just as an interim summary of this section, we do see a clear-cut effect in rodent models um, for a role for Parkinson's disease and this imbalance between uh, particularly dorsolateral striatal uh, systems and, um, uh, and, the, and um, uh, the ventral um, striatum, or more particularly perhaps more substantia nigra pars compacta and uh, ventral tegmental area. And this plays a role in terms of increasing condition place preference, but not necessarily the willingness to work for pramipexel. You see this increase in delta phosphy accumulation in the medial striatum. And particularly in the lesion rodents, you see this relationship between this willingness to work or the behavior and associated with delta phosphy accumulation in the nucleus accumbens core. And this isn't restricted only to pramipexel. We also see greater reinforcement value associated with levodopa with increases in CPP. Okay, so let's go on to ask um, how dopamine function it's, itself is affected. And here we're gonna focus in particularly on um, phasic dopamine rather than tonic dopamine. Um, certainly there's a whole range of different behaviors so that could be taking place with regards to tonic dopamine, um, but for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus in on phasic dopamine. And phasic dopamine encodes um, something called prediction error. So this is the difference between um, actually ex um, experiencing or the actual outcome versus what you think you're going to get or what you predict you're going to get. And that acts as a teaching signal. So let me walk you through this. So what happens if you see, um, for instance, um, an ad for a restaurant and you've never been to this restaurant before? You go to the restaurant, turns out it's amazing. So you get this phasic increase in dopamine at the time that you're in the restaurant. And it teaches you that the next time you see this ad, perhaps you should consider changing your preferences or changing your choices and going to this restaurant. And as the ad is associated or you learn this association, um, the do phasic dopamine signal moves much more early in time and is then associated with the prediction itself or the ad. Now what happens if you then go to this restaurant and you have this horrible time? You then end up with this phasic decrease in dopamine um, or a pause in dopamine activity, and that acts as a negative prediction error signal. So telling you the next time perhaps you see this ad, you may not want to go to this restaurant. And there's some evidence to suggest that perhaps these phasic increases in dopamine, which again act as a teaching signal, may be more likely to, um, to, be, to engage D1 and D2 receptors um, given their, the, their affinity, but that the tonic activity in particular, these pauses in activity and the negative prediction error may be more likely to engage the D2 receptors, which are much more high affinity. And what has also been postulated or hypothesized is that the dopamine agonists may indeed be specifically impairing negative prediction error signals. Now, there's some very nice evidence from um, rodents um, looking at, at underlying um, physiology to suggest that chronic there's differences between acute dopaminergic medications and chronic dopaminergic medications. And in this particular study, we're looking at uh, the role of acute versus chronic levodopa administration. So 
um, what we see here is when a when a rodent um, is exposed to an external stimulus that's potentially rewarding, only a certain proportion of cells are capable of eliciting a phasic dopamine response. And the, that proportion is a spontaneously active proportion. And so you can see here that's approximately 50% of these cells in orange here on the top. In the context of chronic levodopa, we then end up with this increased proportion of cells that are of dopaminergic neurons that are spontaneously active or then capable of then eliciting a phasic dopamine response. Indeed, this is work from Tony Grace's group. And what you see here is an intact, um, an intact animal. We also see here um, a, a Parkinsonian rodent model. And what he's done is looked at the effects of acute levodopa but also chronic levodopa. And you can see that chronic levodopa is associated with an increased proportion of spontaneously active dopamine neurons as compared to acute levodopa. And indeed, we see a somewhat different, a somewhat similar pattern um, in um, uh, response to acute versus chronic pramipexal. And here we're looking at the mean rate of firing of dopamine. And what you see is that with acute pramipexal, you get this decrease in the mean rate of firing of dopamine neurons, whereas with chronic, it normalizes to actually very close to um, that, of, um, uh, that of baseline. And both of these, um, this kind of um, elevation or increase in the context of chronic administration has been shown to be associated with the 2 autoreceptor um, regulation. So what this tells us then is in the context of chronic levodopa, what happens is that there's this increase in the proportion of spontaneously active dopamine neurons or the neurons that are capable of firing a phasic dopamine signal in the context of an, 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 an unexpected reward. So what you then get is potentially an increase in the physiological activity or the physiological um, it, number of neurons uh, that are capable of firing um, with, uh, with these phasic rewards or with this phasic activity. There's two other pieces of the puzzle that, that are worth mentioning. Um, so again, this one is um, in the context, again, of the D2 autoreceptor. And I'd mentioned before that the D2 autoreceptor down regulation may be playing a role in terms of this kind of chronic um, the differences between acute versus chronic administration of dopaminergic medications. And there is actually evidence in human studies, so this is now Parkinson's patients with impulse controlled behaviors, and this is work from um, Antonio Strafella's group. And what he's shown, again, it is a slightly, it's a smaller sample size, but what he's shown is he's looked at 11-carbon FLB457, which is a ligand that binds um, outside of the striatum, so in this case they're looking specifically in the midbrain, and it's binding to D2 receptors, so presumably presynaptic um, D2 autoreceptors. And it's a little bit of a complicated um, slide, so I'm going to walk you through it. So on the left here are these Parkinson's controls, so the Parkinson's patients without gambling symptoms as compared to those with gambling symptoms. And what you see is um, what the Parkinson's patients um, are either uh, scanned with FLB457 or else they are scanned while they're playing a gambling task. And it's been shown in previous studies that playing this gambling task is associated with an increase in release in ventral striatal dopamine. Okay. So what happens is the ventral striatal dopamine then binds to the presynaptic D2 autoreceptor and there's this decrease in the binding potential of the FLB457 ligand. So that's why in the control group, you see this decrease with the gray bar um, being lower than the white bar. But in the gambling group, we actually don't see this. So indeed in the gambling group, but then, and this group has also shown that when they're playing this gambling task, you get this increase in ventral striatal dopamine release. So in fact, you should actually see a greater decrease in the binding potential of FLB457, but you don't see it. So what they suggest is perhaps this may be related to D2 autoreceptor impairments in sensitivity, that they're less sensitive. And what this would mean is 
normally the D2 autoreceptor plays a role in terms of feedback mechanisms, um, in terms of regulating the release of presynaptic dopamine. So indeed, if it were less sensitive, what that would mean is there's actually an increase in the release of presynaptic dopamine. So that's one potential mechanism that might play a role in terms of why ventral striatal dopamine activity might be perhaps enhanced in this population. So we're going to go on to a slightly different mechanism now. This is looking at the dopamine transporter at the level of the striatum. And one of the um, most effective ways in which striatal dopamine is, um, its activity is terminated is actually that it's taken up via the dopamine transporter back into the neuron and then, um, and then deactivated. So that's how, um, that's how the activity is actually terminated in the synapse. And there's now actually several pieces of evidence, so at least three or four studies to suggest that dopamine transporter levels in the striatum, and particularly the ventral striatum, in, in those with impulse control behaviors is actually decreased in com as compared to Parkinson's controls. Okay, this is with similar levels of neurodegeneration, so it's not related to a decrease in dopamine terminal density. And what this might suggest then, and again, um, I'm just showing an image here, um, uh, of this um, decrease in dopamine transporter density. And indeed, there is a study that suggests that um, this might actually precede the exposure to dopamine agonists or medications. And indeed, it might then act as a potential biomarker or predictor for the development of these behaviors. So what you'd expect then is if there's a decrease in dopamine transporter density, you might then end up with dopamine um, in the synaptic space that might then act for much longer in time, um, but also um, have, a, have a wider spread in activity. So potentially these are some of the different ways in which um, physiological dopamine might actually act for much longer, um, so a much greater enhancement of the underlying physiological activity. So just to summarize that section, um, we see that chronic levodopa increases spontaneously active dopamine neurons, or the ones that are capable of eliciting a phase of dopamine response to a rewarding, to an unexpected rewarding stimulus. We see that in the ICD patients, um, there's a decrease in D2 autoreceptor sensitivity. We also see a decrease in striatal dopamine transporter density, and this actually precedes, or at least in one study, suggests that it precedes or occurs prior to drug exposure. So it isn't secondary to only um, the drug exposure itself. And there is some evidence or some a hypothesis that a dopamine agonist may potentially interfere with negative prediction error activity. So now let's move into talking about cognitive mechanisms. And we're going to ask what, why someone would choose something that's potentially risky, potentially rewarding. Um, it's an immediate choice and it's a poorly considered choice. And we'll walk our way through this. We're going to start by talking about the rewarding activity. And certainly it fits very nicely in terms of um, uh, what we've just been discussing in terms of an enhancement of physiological dopamine activity. We're going to talk a little bit about um, rewarding um, visual stimuli and then potentially learning from, um, learning from outcomes. So this is again work from Antonio Strafella's group and um, this is using 11 carbon rack applied PET scanning where the ligand binds to the D2-D3 receptor and if there's an increased release of um, dopamine in the synapse it can then decrease the binding potential of um, uh, uh, binding potential of rack applied. My apologies, this is actually from Paula Pacini's group, the, the, these two, this, this current slide here. And what you see here is um, the um, Parkinson's controls com compared to Parkinson's patients with impulse control behaviors, and they're shown various visual rewarding cues. And the ICD patients have this enhancement in ventral striatal release of dopamine, so in blue compared to red, which you don't see um, with the, in the dorsal striatum. And indeed, the, the same group has also run studies 
um, using functional MRI, looking at the bold response in response to different um, rewarding cues. And what they see is specific to sexual cues in those with compulsive sexual behaviors, um, which they don't see with other types of rewarding cues. And they see enhanced activity, bold, a bold response in the ventral striatum. And what they also report is that there's this correlation with an increase in sexual desire or wanting, but not necessarily of liking. So this willingness to potentially work for this reward, but not, not necessarily because they're enjoying it or obtaining pleasure from it. And they've taken this to mean that this might support an incentive motivation hypothesis. Now, this particular set of studies is from Antonio Strafello's group. And here they've been looking at the Parkinson's patients with gambling and without gambling behaviors. And again, they've been using 11 carbon raclopide and looking at the binding potential in the context of either um, of, of endogenous dopamine release. And here, this is a gamble task that, they, um, that they've exposed the subjects to. And again, we've discussed the gamble task previously. And indeed, the gamble task in the ICD patients is associated with an enhancement or an increase in release in ventral striatal dopamine. So you can see this decrease here on the right um, in the binding potential of raclopride. Now what's particularly interesting though is actually this control group. So the control is, so these are gambling patients um, and when they're doing just a straightforward motor task, a straightforward control task, you actually see that there's a decrease in binding potential to wrap applied also in that control task itself. And that's potentially intriguing. And the authors initially had explained this as being related to low D2, D3 receptor binding or receptor density in the striatum. But in fact, there's been multiple studies now to suggest that actually even at baseline without any task, there's no clear cut decrease or, or change in D2, D3 receptor density levels in the striatum. And that actually differs from what you'd expect in the general population. You do indeed see that, say for instance, pathological gamblers in general population, you do see that there's no clear cut change or decrease in D2, D3 receptor density, but certainly in terms of um, say substance use disorders and particularly something like amphetamine, you do see a decrease in D2 receptor density in the, in the ventral striatum. But this, the other implication of this decrease in binding potential in the control um, task would also suggest that in response to multiple tasks, we end up with this increase in physiological release of ventral striatal dopamine. And that would suggest again, and in keeping with the idea of an enhancement in physiological um, dopamine release. So this is a study that we did looking at um, learning from uh, rewards and losses. And here I'm gonna focus in particularly on the reward domain. So in this um, study, subjects choose between one of two stimuli, one of which is more likely to be associated with winning um, as compared to the other. And what you see here is that the ICD patients when they're on medications are learn much faster from rewards as compared to off medications. Um, which you don't see as much in the Parkinson's controls. And when you then extract out prediction error and the expected prediction on a trial by trial basis, you see that there's an increase in um, activity in the ICD patients um, associated with prediction error and expected prediction in the striatum. Um, there's been a group that's also looked at this um, and shown similar results with regards to the reward domain, but slightly divergent results with regards to loss domain. So in this particular task, um, again, the ICD patients, they see a single, um, so here they see a single um, stimulus and it's a probabilistic classification. Um, so they just need to choose from one of two actions, one of which is um, more likely to be associated with winning with regards to this particular stimulus. And what the authors show is, again, um, at least in the reward domain, fairly similar to what um, the previous slide had shown, which was um, an increase in the number of optimal choices um, in the reward domain. But they also show that um, the ICD patients are perhaps 
more impaired at learning um, from punishment trials also. And indeed, when they look at um, two different computational models of fitting either a cue learning algorithm or an actor critic reinforcement learning algorithm, they see that the actor critic algorithm is a better fit. And what you see here is that the ICD patients are actually more impaired at learning from negative prediction error. So this is actually very much in keeping with the idea that dopamine agonists may be more likely to impair learning from negative prediction errors. So just to summarize this section, the ICD patients have enhanced ventral striatal dopamine release um, within multiple contexts, including reward cues, a gambling tasks, but also to a fairly straightforward motor task. So suggesting that the, this might be in keeping with this kind of enhancement of underlying physiological um, dopamine activity. At least in two studies, we see this increase or uh, greater optimal choices with regards to reward outcomes. Um, and at least in one study, we're seeing this possible suboptimal um, choices with regards to loss outcomes. And this, um, there's some evidence uh, to support impaired learning from negative prediction error as a function of dopamine agonist. So now in this last section, I'm gonna talk a little bit about impulsivity. And impulsivity, um, there's, there's various different types of impulsivity and it's fairly heterogeneous. Um, we can break it up into motor domains and decisional domains, and they have some overlapping networks, but indeed they are also discrete in terms of their networks and underlying neurochemistry. So they are heterogeneous in nature. And in terms of the motor domain on the left here, with conflict and response inhibition, there are um, at least a couple studies that have attempted to test for conflict and also response inhibition in the ICD patients with Parkinson's and shown that there's no clear differences from Parkinson's controls. So it's not clear that there's an impairment in the motor domain. What we predominantly see is actually an impairment in the decisional domain. So with regards to delay discounting, risk-taking and reflection impulsivity, I'm gonna walk you through some of these. So let's first start out with talking about um, risk-taking. Now this is a very nice rodent study, for, um, study from Celeste Napier's group, in which rodents were um, selecting from a small certain lever in which the rodent would definitely get one pellet, or they select from a larger risky pellet uh, lever in which they um, potentially could get four pellets, but with decreasing probability. And what you see here is that rapamipexil increases the preference for this large risky lever or greater risk taking, but there's actually no effect of the um, Parkinsonian um, lesion itself. So the 6-hydroxydopamine to the dorsal lateral striatum. So there's no clear cut effect from Parkinson's disease. It's just an effect of the dopamine agonist itself. And indeed, when you look at um, human studies, now this is looking at um, risk taking in the context of ambiguity. So meaning that um, the risk is um, without knowing the explicit probabilities. So it's in the context of uncertainty. And this is called the balloon analog risk task with a BART. And the subject squeezes the balloon so that it increases in size. And as it increases in size, you gain more money. But there's also a greater risk of it um, bursting. And this is from Dan Claussen. And what you see here is that the Parkinson's patients with impulse control behaviors are much more risk taking when they're on dopamine agonists. So they're much more likely to increase the size of the balloon. And indeed from Dan Weintraub, he's also scanned this particular task um, using um, arterial spin labeling, which gives you sort of baseline activity. And what you see here is that the ICD patients actually have a decrease or lower ventral striatal activity when they're performing this task as compared to healthy controls or Parkinson's patients without ICDs. We've also looked at this task uh, or looked at risk-taking behaviors, but using a slightly different task. And here we're asking people to choose between a sure choice and a gamble. Okay, so this is the area in red is the potential that you could win money and the yellow, the potential that you might not win any money. 
And but what's important is that this extra sure choice and the gamble choice are actually of equal expected value, meaning that if you're picking randomly, you should pick the 50%, or if you're picking rationally, you should pick it about 50%. And what you actually see is that the Parkinson's patients, when they're the ones with impulse control behaviors, are much more risk taking in the gain domain, but not in the loss domain. Indeed, when you scan this particular task, we see a very similar result to Dan's uh, Weintraub's um, uh, findings, which are that you see a decrease in ventral striatal activity in the ventral stride and, and the orbitofrontal cortex. So both of these regions involved in representation of risk are actually decreased in activity in the ICD patients. So we're gonna now move into talking about um, this selection of um, impulsive choice or delay discounting. So wanting something immediately that's actually quite a small reward as compared to being able to delay gratification for a much larger delayed reward. And again, um, this is work again from Celeste Napier's group in which 6-hydroxydopamine has been infused into the dorsolateral striatum. So again, a Parkinsonian rodent model. And what they see with intracranial self-stimulation is that the lesion rats actually have a preference for the immediate reward. So they have greater delay discounting as a function of only and solely the, the lesion within the dorsolateral striatum. So suggesting that Parkinson's disease may potentially be playing a role in terms of enhancing delay discounting irrespective of the exposure to dopaminergic medications. And indeed, this is similar to what we see actually in human studies. So this is one study in which um, this is unmedicated Parkinson's disease compared to healthy controls. You can see that this is, this is increase in delay discounting compared to healthy controls um, in Parkinson's patients who have not yet started medications. So suggesting there's something about the underlying Parkinson's neurobiology that's actually contributing to an increase in delay discounting. Whether that's necessarily dopaminergic or noradrenergic, again, remains to be um, seen. But the um, work from, um, from the lesion, the dopaminergic lesion in dorsolateral striatum might suggest that there may be a dopaminergic etiology. And this concept of delayed discounting is very well established in the substance abuse literature. So we see impaired delay discounting across multiple substances and behavioral addictions. And indeed, in this, what we end up asking is things like, do you prefer a smaller amount today, like $11 today, or do you prefer a much larger amount, $30 in seven days? And what I'm showing here is pathological gamblers in a general population being much more um, likely to discount delayed rewards as compared to control. And there's actually been now multiple studies, at least three or four studies, looking at delay discounting and impulse control behaviors in Parkinson's. So this is the most robust finding in impulse control behaviors in Parkinson's. And this is from the Dominion study. So you can see that sample sizes are actually quite large. So at least uh, more than 50 or so per, per subtype of behavior as compared to 282 Parkinson's controls. And here we're talking again about subtype differences. So here we're seeing that those who have compulsive shopping are much more likely to delay discount or discount delayed rewards and have greater impulsive choices compared to Parkinson's controls. And this is a bit of a trend with the gamblers. But we don't see anything with those who are binge eaters or hypersexual. And what that's telling us is that Someone, say for instance, who presents to the office who's male, is a high novelty seeker or, or um, high in, in delay discounting, may be more likely to gamble, for instance, where someone who is um, female, um, low in novelty seeking, and low in delay discounting, may be more likely to binge eat as compared to shop. So it's starting to kind of tease out differences with regards to, um, to uh, behavioral subtypes. So let's move now into talking about um, how the choices are considered, so a poorly considered choice. 
And here this is looking at the amount of evidence you accumulate before you make a decision. So it's also called reflection impulsivity. So this is the idea of someone who say, um, might um, spend ages on the internet looking up different types of mobile phones or cell phones before they buy one as compared to somebody else who just walks into a store and buys one immediately. Okay. So this is the concept of reflection impulsivity. And here you can test this using something called the beads test or be, um, the beads in a jar test in which one of the jars is associated with um, a higher proportion of red beads compared to blue, so 80% red compared to 20% blue, with the opposite contingency in the other jar. And you're just told that the computer is going to pick from one of the jars and it's going to show you a bead at a time until you've made a decision about which jar the computer is picking from. So in this case, you can see here a red bead, a red bead, a blue bead. Um, and someone who's very impulsive might make a decision after two beads, and someone who's less impulsive might make a decision after 15, 20 beads. And what this study shows, again, I'm missing a few bits here and there. I think it's a transition from Mac to something else. Um, what you see here is that the ICD patients make much more um, are much more impulsive on this domain. So they pick um, fewer beads. Very similar to substance use disorders, we also see that there's no clear differences with regards to um, gamblers and Parkinson's controls. So here are the ICD patients have impaired reflection impulsivity. So just to summarize this section, um, we see that Pramipexel increases risk-taking in rodents with no clear-cut no clear effect from Parkinson's disease, and that the ICD patients when they're on medications are much more risk-taking. With regards to delayed discounting though, we see both an effect of the Parkinsonian rodent model, so Parkinson's itself, plus also the effect of the dopamine agonists. And in fact, um, we see that in um, in terms of the Parkinsonian lesion, we see that both in a rodent model and also with unmedicated Parkinson's disease, both of those enhance um, delay discounting. And there seems to be some subgroup differences with regards to delay discounting, particularly in shoppers and gamblers. We see that the ICD patients have greater reflection impulsivity um, as compared to the, their controls. We don't see any differences in, in the motor domain. Um, so there's no clear cut in, um, differences in terms of the stroop or the stop signal task. And it may be that so this decisional impulsivity is much more likely to implicate particularly the ventral striatal regions, whereas um, conflict and response inhibition may be sli slightly different regions that are involved, perhaps more mesial striatal, perhaps more um, hyperdirect pathways to the subthalamic nucleus. So it's slightly different kind of mechanisms uh, that might be involved um, in terms of these cognitive mechanisms. And indeed, this actually is highly relevant with regards to deep brain stimulation targeting the subthalamic nucleus. But again, just in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to leave that section. So this is the last bit, and just to highlight a little bit about treatment issues. Um, there are case series to suggest that decreasing or discontinuing the dopamine agonist can be potentially effective um, in, in some of these patients, although it actually can be very difficult for people to tolerate. There is a risk of dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome that's been highlighted by Melissa Nuremberg. And what we see is the ICD patients are at greater risk um, of developing this stereotyped withdrawal syndrome associated with anxiety, craving, dysphoria, um, autonomic symptoms. So fairly similar to what you expect in terms of a withdrawal syndrome from stopping um, a, a substance of, of abuse. Um, and it also suggests that um, there's likely sensitization effects um, with regards to these medications. There is some evidence for amantadine being potentially effective in a randomized control trial study in a small group of patients. But again, there's a little bit of a, um, uncertainty because in the Dominion study, it's also been shown to be associated with impulse control behaviors. This is a very nice study from David Okai suggesting that cognitive behavioral therapy um, can in a randomized control st trial study be effective for global symptom severity in the ICD patients and Parkinson's. And there's some evidence for the use of naltrexone, which is an, an opioid antagonist, 
and it seems to improve in a randomized controlled trial study, impulse control symptoms, but not necessarily global symptom severity. So now I'm just going to conclude. Um, the ICDs are relatively common. They occur in about 14% of Parkinson's patients on dopaminergic medications. And certainly it's something that um, patients, caregivers, um, and clinicians should be um, quite sensitized to. This is mixed interaction between individual vulnerability, the potential role for Parkinson's disease interacting with dopaminergic medications. And these Parkinsonian, um, the more recent studies suggest that Parkinson's disease may itself be playing a role, particularly from Parkinsonian rodent model studies, showing that there's an enhancement in the reinforcing properties of dopaminergic medications. There seems to be an abnormal regulation of dopaminergic function, which might be enhancing physiological dopamine activity. And we can see that chronic levodopa, for instance, increases spontaneous dopamine um, neuron activity, or the proportion of spontaneous neurons that are activated. We also see a decrease in D2 autoreceptor sensitivity and a decrease in dopamine transporter density at the level of the striatum. And this um, results or is um, manifested in an increase in striatal dopamine release and activity to reward cues, but we also see it to other contexts like a gambling task to unexpected and expected rewards. We see greater decisional, but not necessarily motor impulsivity. So we see greater risk-taking, delay discounting, and reflection impulsivity, potentially implicating more ventral striatal regions. And again, we also see that um, uh, deep brain stimulation targeting the subthalamic nucleus might potentially improve impulse control behaviors, um, but on balance, um, it doesn't seem to improve and may perhaps exacerbate um, overeating type behaviors, so specific to food rewards. Anyway, thank you. So I think I'm going to end here. And um, I apologize because of timing issues. Um, I'm not able to take any questions. So very much apologize for that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boone. And thank you to our sponsor and our technology for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I would like to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing until September 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.